Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the really lovely stuff. This is the AAAS IOP ebook series. And I am super happy to have author Cameron Reed with us today. Hey, Cameron. Hi. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's, uh, it's fun to be here. Well, and I was uh, really pleased when I learned from IOP that there was this association with the AAAS to yep. uh, promote these series of books. There we go. We're doing here. Yeah, it's a very lovely one. So thank you very much. And uh, Cameron, what's your what's your geolocation? Where are you at? Well, uh, right now, physically, I'm in the Halifax, Nova Scotia area. Okay. Um, my affiliation is that I'm uh, retired a few years ago from Alma College in Michigan. Okay. And um, but uh, still keeping active. Very good. Oh, you're still writing books. So there you go. <laughs> Very cool. Um, and Cameron, um, what gave you the idea? So this is the second edition of the book. And what gave you the idea to do the first edition and then to follow up with the, the second edition? How did that all work out? Um, yeah, the uh, here's the second edition of the beautiful nice. cover. I love the the sort of the warmth of the sun there. Yep. Uh, well, the first edition with IOP was, um, I guess, about four years ago. And uh, I guess it it began when I was a student many, many decades ago, and orbital mechanics was a part of the standard dynamics class that every physics student took. But uh -huh. um, having an astronomy interest, you know, that really captured my attention. Mm -hmm. Um but I, I've kind of always felt that there's so much crammed into a a typical dynamics class, right? Uh, and and this is such a beautiful subject with its its astronomical connections and its historical connections that <clears throat> I just always wanted to learn more about it, and you know ended up just accumulating some of this uh, background and passing it on to my own students in in astrophysics and dynamics classes. And so the the idea then kind of came a few years ago. Well, maybe you know, maybe a, a, an attractive thing for students who want to learn more about this uh, would be a kind of a bite-sized book. It wouldn't be encyclopedic, uh, but give them a, a nice survey of orbital mechanics that would go beyond their typical class. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, but you know, set them up for uh, more. Um, more things that they might want to explore. And so it just kind of evolved from there. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and let me ask, I'm, since I'm always kind of curious how long these things take. So once you decided to do that second edition, was that a four-year project, a one-week project? How much, how oh, much did it take to go from first edition to second edition? Probably about a, a semester, like a typical school semester. Okay, cool. Uh, be, because the original was done uh, then a few years ago and, and originally done in Word. Mm -hmm. uh, and so much of the, there was a, a mechanical period of getting this transported over to tech, right. uh, which turned out to be not as bad as I anticipated. <laughs> uh, and and then... You um, fight tech for hours. <laughs> it, it wasn't so bad. Um Fortunately, the equation editor I had been using as an add-on to Word had a oh, yeah. uh, had a provision for saving code in tech. Nice. And you so that just became a, that a, a kind of mechanical thing. Yeah, that and helped uh, that helped a lot. Uh, and then adding some new sections, um, cool. which I, I had like a half dozen or so new sections that I wanted to add and and cleaning up some of the existing stuff. Okay, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get into it and walk through the book and you can point out those new sections that were added. Um, <laughs> we go. And so here we go. We are going to take a look at this very lovely ebook, Keplerian Ellipses, second edition, a student guide to the physics of the gravitational two-body problem. And Cameron, take us away. Okay. Um, am I allowed to scroll? I do. I'm going to do the driving. Oh. You're, you're going to tell me. Okay. What... You're, you're driving. I'm driving. <laughs> that way we get the interaction going. 
Okay. Uh, so there's a grand total of uh, eight chapters. Mm -hmm. um, and I've wanted to, to keep them um, each kind of reasonably self-contained, but building on the earlier ones. Okay. Uh, so I began with uh, what I hope will be familiar with many students in, in the first couple chapters with um, polar coordinate, mm -hmm. uh, polar coordinates, their corresponding unit vectors, <clears throat> and the um, expressing the, the physical quantities like position and acceleration and angular momentum and force and whatnot in that coordinate system. So that sets up, sets up very general stuff. Uh, that uh, will be used later and which hopefully students will have seen in a dynamics class. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so that gets set up in uh, but a few pages. Uh, yeah. uh, and that, um, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I always try to link it back to things students will have seen in other contexts. Like you can take the expressions for acceleration in polar coordinates and show how the specific case of the traditional or uniform circular motion is embedded within that. Cool. Uh, and um, so it's also full of little exercises like that attached to each section. Oh, very good. Let me take a, um, I want to take a look at that actually. So let's see. Can I just... And uh, it's hopefully students will be interested enough to do as they go along. <laughs> Probably once you get into the third chapter for that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. There we go. <laughs> I was just checking it out. Okay. Central forces. So we got oh, state vectors, okay. coordinate systems, and now central forces. Yes. Uh, so that then begins the, um, you know, the gist of the orbital material, um, showing how you can take a two-body system and reduce it to a one body system, just analogously to a hydrogen atom in quantum mechanics. Right. So students will see that in, in other contexts, mm -hmm. uh, relationships between force and potential. Uh, and I love Newton's word of sesquialterate. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I don't think I've heard that word before. <laughs> it means a, um, a Latin for three halves power. Uh, from okay. from okay. Kepler's third law. Very cool. And, Very cool. Uh, okay. and I had to get I had to get that in there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's that's wonderful. <clears throat> I did not know that. Very good. Uh, so, so a bit of the history of say looking at the um, centripetal acceleration of the moon's orbit compared to the usual g of nine point eight meters per second squared, and how Newton might have divined that an inverse square law was going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, because otherwise it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the usual GMM over R square just kind of comes out of nowhere. <clears throat> uh, the role of angular momentum, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, is, just persists throughout the whole thing. Absolutely. Uh, and is, so chapter three isn't yet specific to an inverse square law uh, beyond mm -hmm. that one section, uh, but setting up some very general relationships for central forces um position and uh, time as a function of angular position and that sort of thing cool uh to uh to set the stage for later and a, a beautiful uh section that got added um okay mm -hmm. was a uh, this one 3.7 yeah. uh where there's a i think it's an elegantly compact analogous analysis of how the only two potentials that satisfy reducing a point attractor, uh, you know, a, 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 an attractive sphere mm -hmm. uh, mass to a, a single corresponding point right. is the inverse square potential and the harmonic oscillator potential. Cool. Uh, okay. And uh, those are the only ones that, that satisfy that. And that's, to my mind, that's just one of these beautiful, elegant things that, um, right. I think you know students should see if if they don't come across it in a an advanced dynamics class. Absolutely. And um, na nature was so kind to us in giving us an inverse square force for gravity. Lovely, lovely. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Very cool. Central forces, awesome. 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 Uh, and so then it moves on to um, <clears throat> a kind of an intermission chapter uh, on. Uh, ellipses, some of the geometry of ellipses uh, and how Kepler 
uh, in a simplified way, mapped out orbits, uh, to, you know, and, and I think what we owe to people like Copernicus and, and Tycho and Galileo and Kepler and Newton is just, is just so stunning. Um, mm -hmm. the, the beauty of this never ceases to, uh, to catch me and cool. how they determined orbital periods Yes. And uh, for superior and inferior planets, and how Kepler could have mapped out the orbits, and uh, you know found that they were ellipses. And uh, so this this chapter sets the stage on on the geometry of elliptical orbits. Um, nice. Very nice. To uh, and you know, and all of that done, all of that done by these guys without. With, without an inverse square law, uh, all of this empirical observational astronomy and geometry mm -hmm. uh, leads them to these things. Um, it's, I think it's remarkable. Cool. Um, <clears throat> and so that's then, um, <clears throat> uh, then the stage is set for, for marrying the um, central forces in the ellipse. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and that comes together in chapter five, which is, um, that's the biggie, I guess, uh, where, uh, yeah. how can you show, um, mm -hmm. and I try I approach it both ways that, um, you can assume an elliptical orbit and show that that can only be produced by an inverse square law. And then Kepler's third law comes out of it, uh, or conversely and more difficult, you can, uh, go backwards and uh, assume a center, uh, an inverse square force okay. and do the integrals to show that you're going to get an ellipse huh. Uh, huh. to show how the, the two methods sort of um, come together. Uh, and then there's some uh, uh, Kepler's equation. Oh, pardon me. That's the next chapter. Um, but uh, some of the um, applications like say, mimicking looking at the orbit of a spy satellite with high eccentricity um right what happens if you have a non-inverse square central force <laughs> right how does kepler's third law behave uh, okay. and then a taste of um uh, a taste of <laughs> effective potential theory uh because that's another thing students will see of course in um oh, the mechanical type areas and a little bit of uh, perturbation theory of showing how if you give a planet a little radial push, uh, it's going to still remain in a closed orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's um, and it's a, a beautiful connection there to, um, of course, a nice connection to uh, oscillatory motion. Uh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Because of that uh, parabolic shape of the effect of potential. Cool. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and then, um, uh, so uh, chapter five is done just exclusively in the, the traditional polar coordinate uh, origin at the focus kind of perspective. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a, a fairly brief chapter uh, devoted to Kepler's equation and mm. so how these, I love that title, Anomalies, True, Eccentric, and Mean. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and uh, I think yeah. I hadn't really I hadn't really appreciated that anomaly is synonymous with angle uh, mm -hmm. in the Greek usage um, and some of the uh, uh, so how one can sort of simplify some of these things with Kepler's equation and um, at least make the equations look a little less daunting than uh so, so in this uh, in this section, do you go through uh, methods of solution for the Kepler equation? Um, I stuck to mostly numerical yeah. mm -hmm. uh, things there uh, on the rationale that um, you know everybody and his dog has a spreadsheet now, and they can solve this in a millisecond. <laughs> and uh, all those hundreds of methods of solving Kepler's equation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, over the years. 
And, and in yes. fact, there's there's still ways to solve it. I think I just saw this past year there was uh, yet another take on how to solve the Kepler equation, relating it to what is called the goat herder equation. So, um, yeah, it's still, the point is it's still an active area of research. Yes, um, and it's, it's the things that the mathematicians can come up with are really remarkable. Um, Indeed. And, and that's certainly something that, you know, was suggested that uh, uh, if students get hooked on this, you know, that's certainly an area they can look into. Mm. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Uh, the um, entirety of chapter seven mm. uh, was a new edition um, cool. as we're, s and uh, uh, some sort of primers on uh, transfer orbits because um, you know, students will certainly see this kind of thing in discussions of solar system exploration and sending space probes to Pluto and, and uh, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I look at the traditional Holman ellipse uh, and the, the uh, historic Lambert problem where you have um, an initial and final position for a target planet. You're trying to get something there in some time. Yeah. Uh, and but my personal favorite is the ham sandwich throw. I don't think I have heard that term. This was, um, if you can scoot down to page 7-8. Right, let's take a look at the ham sandwich throw. I don't think I have heard Actually, OK, this was a problem proposed in 1960. Holman, we're getting there. Uh, getting there. Go further. Oh. Here we go. Go down maybe about two more pages. Oh, oh if you can pause there. Here's oh. the original problem. How can an astronaut in a circular orbit toss a sandwich to a friend? Okay. Uh, okay. The same orbit. Mm -hmm. um, and this was proposed in 1960. Uh, by Lee Dubridge. And cool. I remember reading about it when I was a student and not having a clue how to approach the problem at the time, but I thought it sounded like fun. And um, in, in his original article is is a, is just a, uh, it's funny, but insightful at the same time. And as to the, something that they make look easy in the movies, uh, but of course, orbital rendezvous is a far from trivial business. Oh, and, uh, um, so he, he describes uh, the italicized part there is, is lifted from his article yeah, yeah. and uh, uh -huh. describes some of the, the problems. If you Got go it. down um, to the next page, there's a nice color ham mm -hmm. sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Bob and Alice. <laughs> we got to get that sandwich there okay got it very cool um, and the um uh, the gist of the problem is to work out okay if bob can throw at a certain speed what direction does he have to throw the sandwich relative to himself Data. to get it into an orbit that will intercept alice the next time she comes around yes and uh it's presented graphically on the I think the next page or the one thereafter. <clears throat> File that. Oh. <clears throat> well, it's a nice application of relative velocities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From mm -hmm. physics 101. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, the next, uh, there's the eccentricity we need. There we are. There's the lovely solution. Okay. Um, so Alice is going to have to wait the better part of a full orbit <laughs> before she gets lunch. Hopefully, hopefully Alice is not too hungry. So, <laughs> um, but actually, this this problem brings up a um, uh, something I tried to emphasize throughout <laughs> in, in various problems where I can slip it in that uh, a lot of these problems are are really tailor made for showing applications of things like series expansions. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. to solve integrals and, uh, <clears throat> you know, classic sort of binomial expansions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to, um, it's a point I've tried to consistently emphasize. Nice. Uh, nice. In 
mm -hmm. in a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Very cool. All right. So now I know what the ham sandwich problem is. I learned something. <laughs> Very cool. So I can have to buy this book because I already learned something. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I already have it. Uh, <laughs> So I have to go through it. Oh, very good. Very, very good. Okay. Let's uh, go back to the ham sandwich throw. Okay. Very nice. And uh, chapter eight is kind of a, a, a catch-all um, of, of various things that, uh, uh, you know, I, until I sort of started digging into this in a little more detail, uh, mm -hmm. I didn't realize astronomers have four methods by which they can quantify the average distance of a planet from the sun. Yes. And uh, uh, it's um, <laughs> and the, uh, kind of a remarkable thing is that simply averaging the um, aphelion and perihelion distances right. Um, right. gives you the same result, the semi-major axis, uh, as averaging over segments of arc length yeah. in the orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, just the way the algebra falls out. Um, uh, and so, but I also put in the um, time and averaged angle dist uh, distances as a function of eccentricity uh, because they behave quite differently. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, both are legitimate. And also the point being made there that um, if you want to define an average, you got to be really careful. Exactly what are you averaging over? Are you averaging over? <laughs> uh -huh. and, uh, because there's different legitimate ways to uh, to phrase that. <clears throat> and I don't um, think anybody's first guess would be that uh, half length is the one that gets you what we say in Astronomy 101, right? Average distance is A. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that was... Uh, uh, I'm sure that probably goes back to Kepler, but when I stumbled across that, it was it was kind of an eye opener for me. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, orbital speed, uh, so very similar business, and that's a nice series expansion integral. Um, yeah. And uh, then um, some sundry things uh, like if you want to put a satellite into orbit around something. Uh, with a certain semi-major axis and period, but you're starting from some location, uh, what delta V do you have to give your rocket? Huh. And, uh, you know, all based on energy and angular momentum considerations. Uh, so I keep trying to reinforce the basic physics. Uh, the Webb telescope this must uh, be addition. section was a new one. Yeah. It's, it's such a beautiful... The LT... Uh, beautiful look at using centripetal force in a way that you probably wouldn't normally think of. Um, and it just works so beautifully in the earth from the L2 point is just about exactly the right size to eclipse the sun. Uh, it's just, just about exactly the right uh, angular size. <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> uh, there's a uh, kind of a proxy look at uh, Mercury's perihelion advance by faking it. Uh, although you can, modif you can modify the expression for an ellipse very trivially to simulate that effect uh, by mm -hmm. including, um, mm -hmm. uh, just by including a multiplicative factor within the uh, angular argument. And it, um, yeah. You can you can mimic the effect yeah. uh, in a way that uh, you can look at analytically without having to, you know, submerge students in general relativity. Uh, cool. But it, um, and then you can use the known perihelion advance to estimate the size of that effect. Cool, very good. And uh, <clears throat> and have a look at that. Um, there's a brief section on doing things like. Uh, how do you deal with meters per second or furlongs to fortnight into astronomical units per day and then <laughs> this sort of thing and um, uh, pointing out that if you want to apply Kepler's third law, you know, whether it's to something orbiting a galaxy or a 
star or a planet, okay. if you express the quantities in units that are sensible to the problem, sure. the the prefactor always turns out to be of order unity. Right. <laughs> and it and it makes for really um, convenient rules of thumb and uh, doing that sort of calculation. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Earth's orbit orientation was um, uh, it's a more, I guess, strictly astronomical thing because, um, uh, you know, I think students sometimes wonder, well, how do we know that, um, you know, aphelion occurs in um, northern hemisphere summer? Uh, yes. How do we know where in the orientation of the orbit the equinoxes and solstices are? Good. Good. Uh, yeah. And it turns out you can do that with pretty reasonable accuracy just from the dates of the uh, solstices and equinoxes on your calendar. Uh, and so it, it presents this as a, ima- imagining an ancient observer yeah. mm-hmm. who can get things to an accuracy of one day. Yes. And uh, you can get the, um, okay. you get the orientation and eccentricity within a few percent. Very nice. Uh, so it's kind of a neat. Uh, Very nice. Uh, mm-hmm. It predicated on knowing it's an ellipse, um, okay. but then then determining the orientation. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and then the, uh, the uh, section on uh, how does this the sun's motion, you know, in response to the four major gas planets of the solar right. system. Very center. Uh, very nice little, little rosette thing, mm. and uh, with a uh, with the berry center often within the sun, mm-hmm. uh, right. and um, but there's an exercise where students look at the angular size of that as seen from Alpha Centauri, and with the technology we have now, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. could that be detectable? Right. So, would you detect, for example, Jupiter from Alpha Cent with a yeah. Radio velocity measurement, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. And it's with patience, somebody out there could do that. Uh, <clears throat> and then the last um, real section is on uh, uh, gravitational flybys, uh, looking mm-hmm. at how, uh, you know, a probe with a given impact parameter oops, is going to be deflected as it uh, passes by a planet. And you can use the limiting case of that uh, to look at the um, uh, basically uh, look at the Newtonian version of the Einstein uh, um, solar limb uh, deflection. Ah, ah okay. Uh, for a really massive object, and uh, and get twice the the relativistic result. Yes. Uh, but of course, it has a nice connection to. Um, just change the symbols and a sign and you've got Rutherford scattering. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Very good. <laughs> um, yes. Then there's a, uh, some appendices with uh, looking at some of the dynamics and spherical coordinates as to, opposed to the planar mm-hmm. uh, polar situation. Yeah. Um, a bit of perturbation theory for uh, non-inverse square central forces. Uh, which has some interesting, um, you know, you can get some integral values of uh, powers in forces that will lead to closed orbits. Uh, that um, they're out there. I guess they don't happen in nature, but in principle, they're there. There. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, it, it ends with hoping that this has whetted the uh, reader's appetite. And there's uh, some suggested uh, sources like journal articles, um, biographies, uh, other textbooks that they could, uh, readers could get into for for more detail. Very cool. Um, Very cool. And then all the formulas and symbols Mm -hmm. are summarized at the end. Yep, (laughs) cheat, (laughs) cheat. Very good. That is awesome. Good. Very good. Very, very good. And Cameron, I want to thank you so much for walking us through this very awesome new ebook. Okay, go get a copy, people. 
Uh, so, uh, you touched on it a little bit. And so let me just ask a little bit, since we talked about some of this is, is still current research um, uh, on, on solution methods to the Kepler equation. Um, so going forward, do you imagine at some point we'll see a version three uh, of this book? Um, I don't know. I, I better ask my wife about that. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yes. But, <laughs> but there are some things that, you know, now occur to me that, well, you know, maybe a little more time spent on techniques for the Kepler equation, mm -hmm. uh, a little more detail on perturbation theory and, and uh, more complex uh, rendezvous problems mm -hmm. uh, would probably be obvious things. And um, of course, you don't want it to expand to be like a telephone book. <clears throat> right. Um, Oh, I know. I was going to ask. So, do you do you, do you mention the the uh, the restricted circular three body problem at all? No, and that's that's another one, uh, right? Which I should. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. If there was, that would be a good chapter to put in because you yeah. can a lot out of that restricted three body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Well, I'll keep my fingers crossed, and I'll hope for uh, uh, permission from significant others to do version three. <laughs> 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 and, uh, um, and yeah, just, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's still an open topic. There are definitely active research topics in this. So. Well, and, and I was just thinking, you know, from that question, there's other connections one can make here, such as galactic rotation curves. Ooh, right. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and mm -hmm. these more, uh, these more exotic sort of applications that, um, you know, right. just think of, a Kepler or a Newton had no idea about an external galaxy. No. And here we go. <laughs> or a flat rotation curve. Or so. a flat rotation curve. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. That's actually a pretty good one. I can see doing that with a, even just a, a Keplerian. What sort of mass do you need to get a flat curve? So, yeah, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there'd be, you know, I think you could easily double the size mm -hmm. of... Um, the thing looking at uh, Earth orbiting satellites for a non spherical Earth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. For example, you want to keep your GPS or Starlink satellites uh, in the right position. Yes. Um, <laughs> no tidal stupid. effects. Tidal, yes. Uh, the moons, the three body parts. Yeah. yeah. Um, so cool. lots of lots of fodder there, I guess, for future. There you go. Awesome. Uh, Good. But I, my my current obsession, and I'll put in a shameless plug here. Go for it. Current obsession is the Manhattan Project. Oh, yes. Okay. Sure. Uh huh. Uh huh. And, and um, so from from astronomy to the Manhattan Project, it's uh, that's quite a spread. That's quite a spread. It, but it's all great physics. It's all fascinating physics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Very cool. That's a great place to end. Cameron, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely and new ebook. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that'll do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And see you on the next one. Bye bye. <laughs>